Hello everybody and welcome to this webinar with the Health Foundation. Um, today what we're going to be talking about is some research that uh, colleagues in the Real Centre have been working on with the University of Liverpool over the last three or four years, looking at the patterns of health uh, facing um, England in particular over the next 15 years up to 20. 40. And I'm delighted today, firstly, to be joined by my colleague, uh, Toby Watt, who has been leading that, this research, who's going to talk you through some of the key findings from the research. And then we've got a wonderful panel to explore some of the implications of that with you um, today. Um, joined by uh, Paul Farmer, who is the Chief Exec of Age UK and uh, has been in that role since uh, 2022. But before that, will be known to many of you for his um, incredible work championing improvements in mental health across country with MIND. Also joined then by uh, Sarah Price, who um, <coughs> works in uh, Greater Manchester and has been involved uh, in Greater Manchester for a number of years now in the uh, devolution deal. And in particular, I think, in the work to, um, to improve prevention and take services upstream and put into practice and make a reality all the things that policy has been talking about for the last uh, 20 years at least. Um, and then also by um, Camilla Hawthorne, who is the president of the Royal College of General Practice and has been working in general practice for over 30 years, most of that time in South Wales. And I, I think that perspective of uh, uh, not just of, of general practice as a whole, but, but also some of those very deprived communities that have been at the uh, sharp end of the implications of some of these trends for so long is very important. So the way this is going to work is this is a recorded webinar. Uh, and it will be available in 24 hours uh, time uh, and then a subtitled version after that. We have a Q&A function um, on Zoom and please put your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat. My role in this is to try to keep us broadly to time, but most importantly to um, man the Q&A function and look at all the things that you're interested in and direct those questions to our colleagues after their first observations. Um, help me no end if you start putting the questions in as we go along and as they, they strike you. Also so then so other people who are listening in today can upvote as it were and we can see what's interesting. If you leave it all to the end of Toby's presentation and the comments, I have to scrabble around and ask questions in your place. So please do, uh, do, do uh, use that. So I'm going to start now by handing over to Toby, who is going to talk us through um, some of the key findings of the report. And he's got uh, 20 minutes. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I hope you're going to enjoy this. Thank you, Anita. Good night. Yeah. Right. And you can you can see you can see this, yeah, good. Uh, so, so first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about this this long term project that we have with the University of Liverpool. Uh, I'll go through some of the key messages from the report and then into some of the detail. And there's two things I particularly want to highlight that would be interesting to have a discussion with uh, this group of panelists. So, um, health in 2040 was the first report from a long term, I mean, uh, well over actually four years of research in development with Liverpool. Uh, we're doing projections for uh, multimorbidity, long-term illness and aging, ultimately to figure out what the pressures are on the, uh, on the NHS and wider public services, uh, so the health and care system. Um, We've done that before, and this is a, is a revamp of, of kind of previous work that the Health Foundation has produced on projections. We're using better data. I'm pretty sure that this is the, the best possible available at the moment uh, with individual level primary care data with complete patient histories. We link that to secondary care data and ONS mortality to get a really complete picture of the ages at which people develop multiple long-term illnesses, um, uh, how long would they live with them for and what combinations are kind of common uh, and, and obviously when 
in their dial as well. The methods, uh, it's a dynamic micro simulation model. So this Liverpool have been working on this for a very, very long period of time. Uh, essentially, you take a synthetic population, a representative, representative population of England, and you run them through the next 20 years of, of their lives. So you know what's happening in 2019, which is the last year that we have data for. Um, you know how many people are living with long-term illness at what ages, and uh, using kind of projection methods, those people either either get more illnesses or die with some probability, and that gives us a really complete picture and helps us understand the dynamics and the way that different conditions are relating to each other um, with focuses on patient characteristics as well that are driving those differences. Uh, the model also looks at key risk factors, so smoking and obesity, uh, as well as bio bio the biological risk factors like cholesterol, uh, physical activity and diet, those we use uh, published epidemiological research um, to understand the link between those risk factors and long-term illness and those trends, uh, so progressively lower smoking rates and higher rates of obesity then feed into these projections as well. Uh, and uh, one final innovation is the, is the use of the Cambridge Multimobility Score. So we're looking at 20 uh, high cost or high prevalence or both um, conditions. Uh, and what this does is it allows us to get us a deeper understanding of or better compare to people with multiple long-term illnesses. A lot of the research that kind of existed prior to this would focus on numbers of conditions and obviously uh, someone living with, uh, with atrial fibrillation and diabetes would have very different needs of the health service and very different quality of life to someone with uh, with a stroke or dementia or cancer. Uh, the key messages, I mean, there could be many more, but we've distilled uh, five core ones from, from the report. Uh, two and a half million more people living with major illness by 2040. This is an increase of 37%. Um, of the 20 conditions that we look at, the prevalence and the numbers of people with conditions are growing for 19 of them. Uh, with over 30% increases in the, in the number of people living with cancer, diabetes, kidney disease, uh, chronic pain as well. The trends uh, are predominantly driven, not just driven, but predominantly driven by demographic changes. So 80% of the increase in, in multimobility that we're seeing is, is down to changes in the population structure. Uh, in addition to that, because people are living longer, people are living longer, developing more long-term illness. Um, and that is also leading to greater complexity of illness. So more people live longer, develop more different kinds of long-term conditions that affect different areas of the body. But a lot of the key conditions that are growing are predominantly managed in primary care. So there's greater complexity there, greater demand on primary care services likely in the future. And so I mentioned the different directions of smoking uh, and obesity. So there's a positive public health message with smoking, which is reducing uh, pressure on new cases of cardiovascular disease and lung cancer. But as an overall picture, we also have growing levels of obesity. So those two things are kind of cancelling each other out. Um, uh, and so the, those kind of benefits that we'd see from other public health uh, uh, positive trends uh, are being mitigated by growing levels of obesity. I'll go into the projections a little bit more now, starting off with the, uh, so this uh, is life expectancy for an individual, so on average at birth, the age at which people expect to die. And we can separate that into uh, different levels of health status as well. And we're focusing on major illness here, which is the, uh, uh, a Cambridge multimodality score of over 1.5, which is kind of arbitrarily chosen, but it gives us a good sense of, of people with complex needs. It's equivalent in terms of uh, mortality risk, likelihood of emergency admission and primary care use as cancer or worse, but it could be reached with multiple combinations of conditions. 
uh, and more than 1.5 puts you in roughly the top 30% of people living with some kind of long-term condition. The point at which we reach major illness is on average in 2010, just over the age of 70. That's the same for 2019, and we're projecting it to be the same in 2040. But in the decades leading up to the pandemic and projected by ONS projections to which these are tied, we're expecting uh, further increases in life expectancy. So life expectancy that's probably driven by better healthcare delivery, better health technology and better management of long-term illness versus improvements or dramatic improvements in population health. So people are kind of getting sick at the same age or developing long-term illness at the same age, but living longer with that illness, what we call uh, in the uh, parlance a expansion of morbidity. So on top of that individual level change, there's big projected demographic changes uh, that have already started and are projected to continue over the next 20 years. So low fertility from about 1980, uh, follow, following immediately following the uh, baby boom, means that the ONS projects that the population in England is going to grow by three and a half million people, of which 3.6 3 million people are, likely, are going to be over the age of 70. So 96% of the population growth in England is people over the age of 70. Uh, what's particularly important, if you go back to the previous, that, that 70 cutoff, that's why we've kind of chosen it there. Um, people born in 1965 will be 55 in 2020. So of working age and before reaching that point in 2040, there will be 75 uh, in retirement age and likely living with uh, complex multimorbidity. Those two things add together uh, to paint a picture of growing demand for health and care services uh, and an increase in the number of people living with, with major illness uh, to the tune of 9.1 million people, which is about one in five of the population. Um, three and a half million of this is going to be people of working age, which is quite a big chunk of the working age population. Uh, the growth in this in this group is not as high as it is for the aging population that relates to that, that demographic change. I think it's worth highlighting as well that the next 20 years is, is a progression of the previous 10. Uh, and so in the period leading up to the pandemic, whilst um, investment in NHS was slower than it had been in previous years, and particularly, and Camilla, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, the number of GPs did not increase while we were seeing a big increase in the numbers of people with uh, complex illness that required a lot of primary care services. The analysis that we've done allows us to look at individual conditions as well, uh, really striking uh, and uh, a benefit of using primary care data here is that we're getting a much better, a richer picture of especially chronic pain, which was very, a very striking result as it probably doesn't get uh, as much discussion as it deserves. Uh, so diabetes and chronic pain growing by over 1.5 million cases. Uh, we're going to see not just an increase in the number of people living with major illness and different conditions, but a shift in, in the makeup of those conditions as well. 30% uh, increases for cancer, COPD, and chronic kidney disease. Uh, and in most cases, these, this growth is given, driven by demographic changes I've mentioned. What was interesting digging into the kind of moving parts that determine uh, the prevalence of long-term illness in a population is there, there are two things that determine it. It's the incidence uh, and mortality rates. If we think about prevalence as a big bathtub, with incidence rates as the tap going in and, and the mortality rates or remission for some cases as the plug going out. Um, what I would have, what I might have expected is, is big changes in incidence rates uh, for a lot of these long-term conditions. But actually, we're seeing growth in the numbers of people living with illness, but it's not necessarily driven by growth in incidence rates over time. And this was one of the kind of key learnings. Uh, for, for us doing this analysis is, is a better understanding on 
the drivers of prevalence in a population over time. So this is uh, uh, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes, uh, the black line, and then projected the dotted, dotted black line with incidents and then deaths, not deaths from diabetes, but deaths for people living with diabetes. That's the plug out of, uh, as, uh, based on uh, as in relative incurability of, of, of type 2 diabetes. And so compared to, so compared to the size of the prevalence, the levers or the, the kind of the tools that are available or, or a, you're able to maneuver through population health change or, or, or prevention are relatively small compared to the prevalence. The growing prevalence of type 2 diabetes is not related to growing incidence, but because the incidence rate is higher than the mortality rate. So, and I think Sarah might talk about this in terms of prevention as well. Uh, it's in order to get the black line to go down, you would need to have very, very low rates of incidence and um, uh, prevention policy would have to be very, very effective to, to achieve that. Um, it's ultimately, of course, uh, a noble thing to, um, to, to focus on. Uh, but I think this chart shows really strongly that the benefits from that would take a long time to, um, uh, uh, to, be, to come to fruition. Uh, and on that, this kind of second little tidbit from the report is the uh, is the lifetime risk associated with obesity. So looking at the longer run obesity trend, um, since the early 1990s, obesity has basically doubled from 15% to 28% in 2019. Uh, the current obesogenic environment uh, kind of shifted through that point and we had more affordable, uh, more calorie dense uh, uh, foods and that's, Shown, borne out in the data, but the recent trends have shown that the increase in people in the number, share of people living with obesity has started to slow. But that does not mean that the growth in the risk is over. Um, the increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes, for example, in a single year is not that big. The most important thing to think about is the accumulated lifetime risk and What's important here is that a 60 year old today was 30 at the beginning of this and has lived their, a lot of their adult life through that change. Whereas the, the, the next 20 years, 30 years of people will have lived after that change. Uh, and so even though the growth in obesity is relatively flat, the lifetime risk will continue to increase and that's what's driving a lot of our results as well. Um, so returning now to the kind of headline figures, the number of people uh, living with major illness is projected to increase by 37%. Uh, an important thing to do is to compare that to the size of the working age population. Um, people who are, will be asked to, to care and, and fund um, uh, the, that growing population health need, that's growing by 4%, so nine times faster. Um, the two and a half million, whilst it does sound like a really big number, 37% is a big chunk of growth. It is happening over the course of a long period of time, two decades. So we're talking about a growth of one to 2% a year. Uh, it's gradual, it's big if you look in the long term, but that means we can do a lot more big things to meet the challenge um, over the next 20 years as well. Um, I think research like this is, is very important. That's why we've taken such efforts uh, and so much time to, to deliver it. I think a lot of the key messages are that longer life is kind of an immediate consequence of better health technology and delivery, and it's ultimately a good thing. Um, but the way that we're getting it is through better medical intervention rather than better population health. And I think it's worth revisiting that. Um, the 1.5, the major illness, we had to put a label on something. Uh, it's worth noting that you can have major illness without it being debilitating long-term illness, type 2 diabetes, and in combination with atrial fibrillation will get you there. It's not necessarily kind of super high needs or, or high risk of mortality conditions. 
um, more people are projected to be living with major illness uh, and longer with major illness. Uh, and so the uh, role of public services and the health service will be helping people to live well with that illness. That will be a key challenge going forward. Uh, and a focus on prevention and innovation is vital for reducing the impact of illness on the quality of people's lives. Um, although based on these findings, perhaps uh, not necessarily reduced demand for, for health and care services um, because interventions that reduce illness will often also extend life. Um, and obviously we would say this is the real center with our focus on uh, analysis for the long term, but uh, it's, it's good to look forward um, and get a long lens uh, to modernize and invest in, in the NHS and wider public service. Uh, and that's me, I'll hand back to Anita. Brilliant, thank you so much, Toby. Before I bring uh, Paul, Sarah and, and Camilla in, there are a number of questions which are about uh, some of the uh, specifics of the modeling and, and next steps, which I'll, I'll just briefly uh, I'll, I'll ask you about. <clears throat> so, so one question was sort of both is the report, but also is the um, model uh, uh, available for people to populate their own data. Would you briefly run through what we've published, uh, where people can, might find it and, and what's forthcoming? Because the other issue people have asked, there's a lot of questions about uh, analysis of inequalities as well. So uh, the code and ultimately the reduced form data will be published. So at the moment, um, Liverpool model is run totally open source. It is quite computer heavy. Uh, so uh, it would need some support, but, but essentially the model structure is such that you can put any population size in it. So it would work at a local authority level or at a local health economy level, for instance. Um, and I suppose the long-term ambition for the project is that we can engage with uh, local decision makers to, to help um, inform resource planning. Um, but in the, in, in the immediate term, that's kind of not on our, on our radar. What, what is on our radar is uh, a project that does a deep dive into the health inequalities that underlie these long-term trends. Um, particularly, we've got, we know that we've got uh, a gap of almost a decade in life expectancy between people living in the richest and poorest areas uh, in England. Uh, it won't surprise you to know that there are huge inequalities in the uh, age at which people develop different long-term illnesses as well. Uh, and so later on in the year, we're hoping to publish uh, a report that, that mirrors health in 2040, but with a focus on, on health inequality yeah. as well. The other thing that uh, people are asking about is the impact of COVID. And, um, and, and obviously this was, last was focused on chronic disease, but also, uh, so could you say a little bit about our plans to update following COVID? And, and then also uh, a little bit about the extent to which we can clarify and in the data understand um, whether it, the chronic pain is really about uh, MSK, musculoskeletal problems as well. Yeah. OK, so uh, on COVID, as I mentioned, the, the data permissions that we have stop um, in October 2020 and the long-term implications for, for COVID and I guess long COVID and how that relates to everything uh, is something that we can't examine with these data. But last week we got approval from our um, board of CTs of which Anita is, is one uh, to extend the, the program of work with Liverpool. Uh, and essentially uh, after this program of work, which will end in the middle of next year, we'll get a totally updated set of data so by then we'll have four years of post-COVID data we'll be able to do a lot more analysis on uh, on that what was the second question so the other one was about um, the extent to which chronic pain is MSK yeah. yeah yeah so what we haven't done but could do uh, looking into the primary care data is look at is try and identify patients that have muscle, uh, MSK and see when they uh, when they're also diagnosed with chronic pain in the data 
the chronic pain is identified in patients by using uh, pain prescribing. So people who are consistently prescribed pain medication over time, that's how we identify patients with chronic pain. So we expect that MSK could be a subset, but we've also seen that, uh, and there's a technical appendix to the report that goes into the detail of which conditions are linked to each other. And chronic pain is one of the kind of uh, the, the most mixed in terms of the numbers of different conditions that contribute to the incidence of chronic pain as well, including cancer and other conditions. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that's, that, that is a question then, which is a final one for you, Toby, at this round, is to explain a little bit, and this is a really important thing, about the extent to which this, this modelling essentially is rooted in the current service delivery response and the current effectiveness of that service delivery response. Yeah. And, and to explain a little bit why that's uh, important and how therefore people should, what it might mean then for how people should understand the results, which yeah. a number of very, very clever people have already uh, clocked onto in the Q&A. That's good. Um, so I guess, so this is where our kind of, uh, one of a couple of different rays of, uh, of sunshine or, or silver lining um, to these projections is that, the Cambridge Mortal Morbidity Score was developed using data in 2015. And so the score associated with each of the conditions, which I didn't chose not to show you the table, but is highest for dementia, um, uh, high for cancer. Uh, and those scores are determined by your mortality risk during the time at which the data was collected and the analysis was done, um, as well as your primary care use and your risk of an, of an emergency admission. Obviously, with different service delivery and more effective service delivery, all of those things could go down. Uh, and so the projections, the use of this 1.5 cutoff for major illness means that we're talking about a very static uh, relationship between uh, quality of life, healthcare use and, uh, and different conditions. Uh, and so that's the nature of projections. We don't know how those things are going to change. Um, and so we leave them as they are, but it's certainly possible, if not probable, that uh, with different uh, prevention interventions, uh, you could see people being diagnosed with cancer earlier, which would have less of an impact on their mortality risk. And so the kind of positive outcomes associated with better public services and better healthcare um, aren't taken into account here. Yeah. And so when, when, when we were talking about the results of this work, one of the things that, that we were emphasizing is, is actually that to some extent this is a call to arms to innovation um, and, and service delivery to think about how we live, how we can live well with this major illness. Uh, it, our, our, our interpretation of this is it, it's, quite, it's quite hard to see how we're going to significantly uh, turn the tide on the amount of major illness through this time, but we have huge potential to influence what this major illness means for people. And perhaps, Paul, that's a good point to bring you in, because in doing a lot of the media in response to this, there were kind of two responses in particular. Is firstly, you know, just as Leah Byrne kind of said, what was it back in 2010? There is no money. There's a little bit of a narrative is that, you know, uh, uh, we can't afford the older people that, we, that we've got going forward. And they've sappled all of the money and, and there's enormous, this is almost intergenerational. Um, uh, uh, implications. I, I, I think most most work shows that most of the public don't accept or like that intergenerational narrative at all. You know, people live in families. Uh, older people care about younger people. Younger people care about uh, uh, old, uh, older people. Uh, um, but but uh, the, the other thing um, that came through is, is that isn't this a rather depressing picture of older uh, a, a, age as well? And as someone who is uh, in 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 Toby's analysis. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I wasn't uh, 65. I was, I was born in 67. This is this is personal uh, 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 as well. So I'd be very interested to hear your reflections on on on, on some of this analysis. 
Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Anita, and thanks very much for inviting me. And thank you also for doing this report. I think it's a really excellent piece of work. And probably at the time of the year, at the time of the year when most people are worrying about what's going to happen this winter, it's pretty important to spend some time looking ahead and thinking about what are the consequences of not acting now in the in in 2040. And I'm also like you, Anita. I'm absolutely in this age bracket. Uh, I will be 74 in 2040, so uh, I have a vested interest in this. It's just worth uh, worth centering, I suppose, for a moment. And what that 70 year old, you know, might might look like and feel like, because I think quite often we have this image of our older people as being the sort of Vera Lynn generation. This this 70 year old will have been brought up on Blue Peter or Magpie, depending on your households, uh, uh, punk and disco. So this is a very different kind of we're talking about a very different kind of person that we're thinking about in in later life. Um, uh, but it's also uh, a group of people where uh, uh, this kind of intervention is going to be hugely important right now, as well as uh, as well as in the longer period. So reports great. Uh, there's so much I could say about it. I mean, what I think is most important is the centering on older people, uh, on the future older generation, uh, which I think is often uh left out of a lot of the narrative in today's discussion um and and you know this is overwhelmingly from the data telling us that this is a challenge associated with aging and our changing population structure so we need to really face into that and think about how do we respond to that in a in a positive way as you say because this could be a huge klaxon alert that we might choose to ignore or it's a huge klaxon alert that we might we really need to pay some attention to so a few things for me that maybe we could pay some attention to now that would be helpful. Um, first of all, one of the interesting, uh, you know, one of the really interesting points in the percentage change prevalence rates is the reduction in coronary heart disease, probably the one area where the greatest effort has been made on prevention over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, hugely important kind of symbol to me about the importance of investing in prevention um, uh, at as, as soon as is reasonably possible, because there is work that can be done uh, both in short and medium term, primary and secondary prevention to um, improve the experiences of this uh, a, a older population uh, when we when we get there. Um, secondly, I think I think there you know a lot of the work that's already being done. There's a clear kind of model for uh, supporting older people services, and we kind of need to get on and uh, embed that model and that that approach. So you know, thinking about anticipatory care, um, the importance of rapid community response for escalating issues. I'm sure we'll hear from Camilla on the importance of that from a primary care point of view, um, and also you know the community. Um, home-based services that are really, really needed to sustain and support this population. But there are not, not going to be enough hospital beds to cope with this, this particular population if it, if it projects as it currently does. So a community home-based approach is crucial. Um, and I think a really strong message about tackling health inequalities, um, really investing in supporting those people with the greatest need, likely to have the greatest multimorbidity, um, and supporting people to to, uh, to, to, to supporting investment in that those particular communities. I think particularly in the context of COVID where we see quite a long shadow amongst the current older people group um, uh, in terms of people's, uh, particularly in people in terms of people who are already experiencing inequalities. Um, and then of course, finally, a big message about workforce. Um, in in the, today's 16, 17 and 18 year old will be 33, 34, 35 in 2040. They'll be forming the bedrock of a future health and social care workforce. And it's really important that we're thinking about how we're attracting and encouraging people into the health and social care workforce at this particular moment, because that, that next generation um, of health and social care providers will be crucial. Um, not to mention, of course, the need to pay attention to um, to, in, to informal voluntary carers and the need for society, I think, to really start to lend, lean its way into thinking about how we support this ageing population in a whole variety of different ways, which will be not just about what the health service does, but also about uh, technological innovation, some of the kind of social change that I think we'll need to see, um, and also uh, some of the environmental change that we'll need to see as well. So I could go on, but lots, uh, I think, to get, a, get our teeth into in terms of really thinking about where the solutions are, uh, rather than seeing this as a big problem that we're just going to kind of uh, put to one side and stick our head in the sand about. Yeah. Can I uh, 
this is really interesting. Your, your, your point about changing expectations and life experience for older people, I think is, it, it, it is really important. And I want to come back a little bit to the point uh, I made about living well mm. with illness. There's a, there's a question in the Q&A about social care, which is really important, but it prompted me to, to reflect in social care, in the, in the, in the 2014 Care Act, the, that Care Act um, very firmly um, uh, set the goal of social care really about, about people's well-being, rather than the avoidance mm. just of harm, as it were, but actually something more positive and very much located it in what was important to people and what their experience was. Do you think that the health and care, and to some extent what this work and we were trying to say is, is that actually if you like that call to arms that within the social care act is perhaps something that is one really important for social care but also really important for the nhs how well do you think that we're doing on that and 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 what would you like to see change really uh, uh around that well i've been traveling around a lot over the last few months meeting our local age uk's and meeting older people who are in those age uk's and i i can see a huge amount of well-being uh being just being de delivered by our by uh local staff and volunteers in our local age uk so i'm uh, uh and and that's like a sense of purpose in people's lives whether that's in volunteering or um uh or or, or in kind of greater physical improving people's physical activity with walking football or dance classes and I went to a brilliant uh, local centre in Bognor Regis where they'd converted a very old-fashioned sort of day centre into a state-of-the-art gym where you saw more lycra than lace in the in kind of people in terms of what was going on in that space so so I think that I think it can be done and voluntary sector is often the people who are best at doing it to be honest um, and, and I think you know you'd expect me to say that that's a a message about how do we make sure that that side of the um, uh, of the of the agenda is really given the priority it deserves because I think it's often slightly seen as the nice to have rather than the must have, um, but I think the potential is very significant and that well being kind of uh, kind of lens uh, from a social care perspective I think really offers opportunities it offers opportunities for people to contribute to society as volunteers in their later life um, and uh, and also therefore to continue their their positive mental health in you know the mental health dimension of this I think is hugely important as well as the physical health um, dimension of it so we know about the benefits of all of those things and yet they're quite often not in the heart not in the center of the thought processes of the health and social care system um, and and they should be because I think it, they're a big part of the solution when it comes to the way that we're going to need to reshape and reframe this the, the the approach to older people and it's about thinking about the older person you know in the round about people's needs and wants and you know sort of crudely it's often it often boils down to health wealth and happiness so health is a huge part of it financial security is going to be an enormous part of this particularly for this this generation who will probably have less uh, financial security um, and with that then comes our happiness our well-being what do we want to do in the next chapter of our life which is now you know in a really good way likely to be 20 to 30 years of life post work or or perhaps a kind of blended time when we'll be doing some work some volunteering and uh, and also doing the things we really want to do so so i think it needs to become more central that that focal point on on what is it that people really want to do how can we equip people to be able to to do that in a in an in, in the context of our our aging society and where's the sense of mutuality yeah. that people we can bring through that kind of collective sense of uh, shared endeavor and shared purpose uh, at a time when the population as we've just seen the younger population is is is, is diminishing thank you so much Sarah, really interested in your reflections, obviously, um, after a long career in public health, but also in particular, I think all the work that, that, that uh, Devo Mank has been pioneering, trying to get ahead on the ICB uh, integrated care uh, agenda to tackle these issues. 
Yeah, thanks, Anita. And um, unfortunately, I'm also in that same category of uh, in 2040 going to be relying very much on uh, on all of these strategies working well in order to uh, make sure that I live long and, and, and prosper, as they say. So um, I think what your report does do is really underline the importance of prevention, as, as we've all been saying. Um, and for me, you know, secondary prevention um, has, has been given a real boost recently with the CMO's report, et cetera, uh, uh, on major conditions, trying to really push that forward. And the pandemic has meant that, you know, we've gone backwards in terms of really well managed um, uh, uh, long term conditions and, and can see that in some of the um, admissions hospital, et cetera. So there's definitely, the, you know, you've given us the evidence again that, that this is a really important thing. Um, and for me, focusing on case finding but also on good management is, is the balance that, that, that we've not really struck. We've either done a lot of case finding and they're not necessarily followed through, or we've um, we've tried our best to manage well and incentivise practices to, to pull people in and manage them well. Um, but but once we stop focusing on them, you know, that that focus goes away. So I think getting a more systematic, really consistent approach to secondary prevention is something that that needs to come out of the of, of, of the work that you've been doing. Um, we've got some really excellent examples. We've got practices, primary care networks, pharmacies, etc., who are working really doing fabulous work. But but we haven't got it consistently. Um, and certainly, the Fuller report last year um, emphasised that I need to do that. So building on that neighbourhood integrated model, um, I think will be really important. And um, on top of that, we've got real problems with data. So what are we going to do? What are the policy implications for this in terms of sharing of information? And how do we ensure that that's smooth? Certainly um, making applications to have access to primary care data and joining that together with secondary care data to be able to get a really strong picture of, of, of the whole population, I think is something we need to really drive forward. And I know it was mentioned, I'm sure Camilla will pick up on the workforce. If we're going to really actively manage um, this age group in order that they can go into an old age, may maybe with major conditions, but but really well managed, um, then, then we do need the workforce to be able to support them to do that. And I know that that's a real issue um, across the country at the moment. Um, making every contact count still, I mean, a bit trite now, but, but, but is still really important. Um, when do we have those opportunities? We're looking after people. Um, we've obviously been doing a lot in tobacco in Greater Manchester. Everyone who goes into hospital who's a smoker is actively managed now. Um, in all our trust, we need to be doing that on a bigger scale. Um, and obesity is something that we need to pick up. Um, and the point about inequalities that Paul made is something that I would really um, want to pick up because although 70 is the average age um, in your data for uh, the the manifestation of long-term conditions in some of our areas in the city of Manchester, for example, it's 55, you know, so that variation is huge and being able to target resource to the people that need it most, I think is something that, that we really need to pick up on. And certainly work done about the totality, those wider determinants. Um, we think that some of the success we've had in Greater Manchester in reducing smoking rates, etc., have been because we have taken a very holistic view and put population health at the heart of what we're doing. So um, the economic review, independent economic review in Greater Manchester that was done in 2009, the reason that health services were brought into the devolution deal was because the impact it's going to have on economic prosperity because people were falling out of the workplace so young um, and therefore not making the best. And that's been repeated in 2019 and we're still struggling with that. So, so the focus has to be on, on a comprehensive approach to prevention, not just on um, uh, the sickness element of it. So while your report is emphasising the need for, for secondary prevention, it's within that wider context that I would argue that, that we need to do that. And ICBs, ICPs are the vehicle through which we're going to deliver that. And the evidence, you know, the work done by the Health Foundation with the University of Manchester has shown that, that putting population health at the heart of things can make a difference to life expectancy um, and uh, uh, improvements. So, um, you know, real uh, focus, therefore, on, on the totality, not becoming too... Um, uh, uh, 
focused in on secondary prevention, I think is something that's really important. And I know you worked on oneness, didn't you, Anita, and that fully, fully integrated, um, you know, fully engaged scenario is still something that, that, that we need to we need to focus on. So secondary prevention, really key to this. And, and you've highlighted that, but, but, but put in that wider context with a focus on on those who are most disadvantaged. Yeah. Thank you so uh, much. I think Camilla's gone 90 degrees and I think someone's going to try and work out how to put Camilla <laughs> back, back there straight. So, so, so what, while we're trying to see if we can, if we can all not have to do that, uh, or she has to do that, uh, um, a couple of things that have come up in the Q&A, uh, Sarah, then that might be quite interesting. Um, so obviously there's, you know, one of the things could expect me to say this, uh, that this raises is obviously questions about affordability and sustainability of health service and how we can uh, manage uh, that. Yeah, and there are a couple of questions about the extent to which kind of new technology it offers some really big opportunities here. And obviously one of the things that's really great with GM is, is, is you've been thinking about healthcare also in this sort of, you know, with that economic focus as, as well and that broader focus. Um, is is uh, AI and new technology on your radar in in in, in GM? Do you think we're we we're, we're we're doing as much as we could do in there? Um, it's definitely on the radar, but I don't think we are doing as much as we could we could be. And with the financial constraints, obviously these are things that people are are really starting to look at. But root so that was my point about data as much as anything else because. Um, if you've got the information, you can target in a way that perhaps you couldn't otherwise. We've done some really good work around management of people in care homes during the pandemic, re, you know, remote monitoring so that people don't get admitted to hospital because the GP can see their information on a daily basis and then visit when they need to. Um, uh, when, when we weren't encouraging people to go in, it was a really good way of, of, of of supporting care homes so that kind of technology I think is really important home monitoring giving more responsibility to the individual um, allowing them to, to to provide information and support to people um, and then um, you know uh, really using it to um, screening and other areas where you can uh, read films or do do those kinds of things you know reduce the need for hospital visits I think definitely we could be doing an awful lot more on and certainly something we're looking at through Health Innovation Manchester. Yeah uh, and one final question then specific to you before I bring in uh, Camilla who is now the right way around so I, <laughs> thank, thank you everyone for that um, which is uh, uh, one of the things that, that sort of comes out of the report and has been picked up in the Q&A is, is, is this report, this work, actually a kind of uh, uh, stimulus for us to uh, think a bit more about how we frame the case for prevention, yeah? <clears throat> so, so what Toby talked about is that essentially prevention obviously does, does to... Uh, things, yeah. It, it reduces the incidence of an individual uh, condition, but it also increases life expectancy. And so, um, and at the moment, certainly, and our modelling, what is suggesting is that uh, the life expectancy effect means that um, <clears throat> if we're more successful with some of the prevention work, um, which is brilliant for individuals, you know, and brilliant for society generally. It might be that actually we're living longer, picking up more conditions. Biology just happens, and actually the health service needs to do a, 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 a bit more. I, I cast that as in the good problem to have. Do you think in public health we need to be very careful about how we make the case for prevention in that wider benefit rather than the prevention is all about saving NHS costs? So I, I absolutely would I would support that as a view because I think um, part of the experience in Greater Manchester is where you integrate across health, social care, other uh, public services and the voluntary sector, you start to see benefit to the population um, that has longer term impact. And, and I know people often say that, that the, the payback in investment in prevention can be very slow, but it can also be very fast. So some of the improvements that you can see with reductions in smoking can be can, can pay back pretty quickly. And, and it's what, what we 
sort of um, choose to count. Um, it's not just about costs to the NHS or cashable yeah. saving. It's got to be about that broader value. And um, and and I think some of the move um, with integrated care partnerships should be mm. about redefining what that's about and 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 looking at that social value um, uh, uh, as well and valuing that. Um, as much as we do around, uh, you know, whether or not you um, can can cash out um, uh, savings within the NHS. One of the great things about working in Greater Manchester has been that that we haven't um, spent so much time arguing about where the savings accrue to. Um, mm. I think there's a risk at the moment with the financial um, position that we're all in um, that 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 creeps back into discussion. Um, but but I'm hopeful that, that that the integrated care model will allow us to to uh, avoid that. Yeah, and, and I encourage people who are interested in that point as well to look at a report from Frontier Economics that came out yesterday and was covered front page in the Guardian, which was looking at the um, impact of um, preventable cancers and just looking at the impact in terms of the ind- on the individual on productivity, on NHS and on social care. And the productivity and the individual impact way swamped the uh, NHS uh, impact, which just kind of adds to that that point that if we use too narrow a lens, yeah, it does skew our prioritization because we're missing these enormously important uh, effects on on society and, and on the economy. Uh, Camilla, um, uh, really interested in your observations now from a, a, a primary care and GP perspective. Uh, yes, of course. Um, that was um, a fantastic presentation. It's been such an interesting conversation to listen to as well. Um, I think that we do need to be starting to think, um, and we haven't really, about the future of our ageing. You know, we talk about an ageing population all the time, but we're thinking about it as now, as current. Currently, the population is ageing rather than, you know, what will the population look like in 2040? So this is a really useful lens on, on what's going on. Um, I've got three sort of reflections and then I want to come and talk about general practice. So um, because, you know, we know that much of uh, what is going to happen to our communities will be looked after in primary care. It already is, but more and more it will be. And we know that the political parties are thinking that as well because they're all talking about it, that um, services will be more and more shifting into the community closer to patients and closer to patients' homes which I completely agree with and think is is really important. I'll come on to the resource um, shifting um, in a minute, but my reflections are, first of all, that we need to think in terms of the healthy life expectancy versus the unhealthy life expectancy. That came up in one of Toby's slides. And when I look at it, it makes me feel really uncomfortable that the healthy life expectancy is not increasing as much as I would like to see it. Um, in increasing and people are still being left with a, a, quite a number of years of being in really quite severe poor health and often feeling really quite miserable with it um, and yes they have a number of chronic conditions all of which we can provide medicines for but this brings me on to my second reflection wouldn't it be better if we could have prevented them in the first place or delayed them in the first place. And I think we need to shift the dial of what we do in the NHS much more to prevention than we're currently doing. Uh, We're only just about coping with the acute care, but we really, really have to find capacity. Um, General practice needs to work with public health much more closely because, you know, a patient may spend 10 or 15 minutes with me, we'll cover a little bit of prevention, but then they go out into the big wide world and wouldn't it be better if when they left my surgery and were crossing the road, they could see a bus that had a public health message similar to the one I've just given them or a billboard or, or a television advert, you know, and, and it just reinforces messages in a way that we're not really doing now. So that's the second of my reflections. And the third one is that I really think we need a cultural change in how we look after and treat our older folk. Um, I've got an elderly mum who's been in hospital and a rehab ward now in a care home. And I really think we're missing something on how we respect people, respect them for their life experiences, respect them as human beings, Um, kindness. There seems to be short supply of that. Caring and actually also dignity. 
a lot of very elderly people lose a great deal of dignity and they hate it absolutely hate it and we're not we're not really dealing with that um, as well as we could be okay so I'm going to move on now and just talk about yes modernizing and investing in primary care how will it be paid for is my question um, somehow Boris managed to find 20 billion for 36 new so-called new hospitals um, I think there needs to be something similar for uh, primary and community care it needs to be spent on um, better integrated working across primary healthcare teams and multidisciplinary teams and social care, really, really important. Um, we need more OT, we need more physio, we need more carers, we need more district nurses, we need more pharmacists, we need more mental health nurses, and of course we need a lot more GPs because what's happening at the moment is the number of GPs, qualified GPs, is going down year on year, not going up in spite of all the promises that have been made, in spite of the long-term workforce plan, um, we also need better infrastructure in which to house these teams so that they can work together. You, you know, it's quite important if you're working well as a team to have that skin contact, bump into people in corridors or over coffee or whatever, and, you know, things that have occurred to you, you can then talk about rather than dealing with people in an impersonal way across a team, uh, people you don't really know very well. We need, you know... Uh, some investment in training as well as in the um, community hubs uh, that, I'm, that I'm talking about. Um, the training, all of us, all of those people I've talked about need training in multimorbidity, polypharmacy, as well as the softer skills of respecting older people and how you deal with older people in a way that makes them feel listened to and, and cared for. Because I think that is just so terribly important it's not happening well enough at the moment and of course as has already been mentioned we mustn't forget third sector and voluntary organizations because again i think paul mentioned it loneliness is just a huge in fact i think it was in the chat or in the q a loneliness is just a major problem uh, for many people but particularly for elderly people socialization uh, keeping minds and bodies active and finding ways for older people to help younger ones. You know, we're just not using all that experience, that life experience that's lying out there that, um, yeah, that we're ignoring. Um, and then my final thought is, okay, here we are. Um, this is, um, was it Laurel and Hardy? This is a fine mess we've got ourselves into because the NHS is in a bit of a mess at the moment. Uh, and what would happen then with future pandemics? How are we going to cope with those? Because they're almost certainly going to be pandemics com coming ahead as well. So yes, it is quite a sort of mishmash of, uh, of things that I've brought in. Um, but I think that um, it, underlying it all is how do we modernise and invest intelligently in the NHS? So, uh, gosh, a series of amazing points. Thank you so much. A, a couple of things that have come out of the um, uh, of the Q&A that chime very much with what you're saying is this twin in, uh, this intersection really of the workforce challenge that is implied here in having more uh, and having enough workforce and Toby's amazing chart that shows 37% increase in major illness 4% increase in the working population that obviously feeding through into the NHS long-term workforce plan which is having this huge expansion I think it's 800,000 more people working in health over the equivalent sort of period, plus the expansion of the social care workforce. So just the sheer need to, to make sure this work is, is, is attractive. But also in the, in the Q&A, someone was raising, and it links to some of your points about rethinking uh, ageing, Hilary Cotton's work on the radical reinvention of the state and the need to put relations at the heart of that and she for everybody who's interested in that it's an amazing work and and two years ago she gave the real center's annual lecture thinking about radically reinventing social care drawing on those principles and i'd encourage anyone uh, listening in today who's interested in that to either listen to the, that lecture or she then wrote a copy of that and that's on our website. But are we being radical enough, I guess, is uh, Hillary, you know, it, it, in the workforce plan, we've basically got 
the sort of roles in healthcare that uh, someone who was born 75 years ago would have recognized then. What we're describing here is um, is actually that almost everybody is going to have multimorbidity, <clears throat> that that evolves through their lives, you know, starts often with things like mental health, with hypertension. People develop combinations of those things that mirror what's going on in their lives. Uh, and, and then they need uh, uh, those deeply relational services that really join up, focus on their well-being. And we still basically got a model of body parts, haven't we? Um, with these really quite siloed uh, uh, delivery systems. So, so, uh, so actually, I'll start with you, Camilla, but I'll ask all three of you, actually, Sarah and Paul. You know, are we just being way too unambitious in our vision for health and social care? Well, I think um, we've got the capacity to be um, ambitious, um, certainly in our thoughts and in our creativity. But right now, um, the NHS is so well weighed down by winter pressure um, about strike action, about about waiting lists, about workload, burnout. It hasn't got the headspace really to be thinking properly ahead. That's why we need organizations like yours to stimulate us into having conversations like this one, uh, which probably need to be replicated a thousandfold, you know, across the UK so that everybody's talking about it. Everybody's excited by it. Everybody wants to do something. Um, because really right now, I feel that we are very, very weighed down um, and we see, we tend to see the glasses half, half empty rather than half full. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, do you have some reflections? Quite interested in just the extent to which with local authority colleagues, other civil partners, you get, you're getting any pressure for health and care to be more radical? I, I, I'm not sure that, that there's a demand to be radical. I think it's the um, continuing demand for us to be present and there, you know. the So, um, I mean, I go to lots of meetings where people say, well, if only social care are involved. Well, in GM, they are absolutely um, involved. And it's that understanding of the breadth of what social care has to offer that, that, that the NHS sometimes needs to understand and the preventative role that they also play in, in, in helping people. But I think your point about ambition, um, I, th I think Camilla's right. We have got a bit down in, down lately and uh, need to, to build back up. And I think one of the issues that, that, that where we have got success we don't talk about it enough anymore because we're so busy firefighting that the, that we perhaps don't see that we've brought tobacco consumption down dramatically or that that um, while obesity might be um, a big issue at the moment there are lots of things that we are doing that are really cardiovascular disease that Paul referred to earlier that we're seeing really improvements and and I think we need to um, be uh, reflecting those just as much and be ambitious in what we can achieve. You know, we've signed up to do, you know, to be tobacco free by 2030. Very, very ambitious programme below 5%. And we're at 14.3 as of yesterday, you know, which feels fabulous. But, but you know, we need to be talking about about that and, and really owning this agenda um, in, in a way that perhaps we don't. So we do need people like you to, to help us to do that. Paul, what do you think? Am I right? Oh, are we all being you're... a bit cautious? Of course <laughs> you are right, Anita. Uh, we absolutely need to and can afford, can be more ambitious. But I think there's a, and I think heart, uh, the heart of that is putting, you know, individuals, uh, I, I'm increasingly thinking much more about citizens than patients, right in the heart of these conversations. And the whole, I think the whole potential of ICS is, is to bring together those community elements you know whether it's public health primary care voluntary sector so community services to create a much more joined up and integrated approach to the way that people receive help and support out of hospital um and and then the the, the last kind of the, the other area i think by way of you know in our investment thinking is of course you know there will always be a debate about rightfully a debate about increased investment but i think i think there's in this agenda particularly on the prevention agenda there's a there's an, there's an argument for thinking about a capital investment in prevention, which which we, you know, we we as a society are quite happy to make capital investments in 
HS2 or an Olympics, uh, uh, but a capital investment in a prevention program, I think would really could be the kind of key that could really unlock um, unlock the opportunities for um, for future generations and indeed for current generations of the current group of older people who you know could really benefit from that kind of the point that Camilla was making about reinforcing the messaging about how do you help to stay well to live well to live healthily um, and also how you effectively can manage the long-term conditions that Toby has really highlighted in the report. So, so you know, there is some radicalism required to help us get, because I think, I don't think the current model is going to be sustainable by the time we get to 2040. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to ask Toby a question about social care. And while I'm doing that, Camilla, Sarah and Paul, can you be having a thinking about, think about how you're going to respond to a question that I'm going to put to you in the Q&A the question is, is about whether there are any international examples of people doing all of this really well. I'm going to allow you both to answer that question, but also to think, because um, you, you, you also work across the uh, country systems, about whether there are any domestic examples as well of things where you go, yeah, actually, you know, that's because always, you know, the, the, the nature of our system, our country, is that uh, we've often got pockets of things which are absolutely uh, out, outstanding and, and they bring us some hope. So, so both internationally and, uh, and domestically, your, where, your examples of things where you think we're, this, is, this is a little slice of what the future should be looking like. Um, Toby. We have a question about why in this work we've talked so much about the NHS and not about social care. And this is because we did some earlier work, um, which is really important, trying to understand um, how illness and interacts with social care. Could you explain a little bit there? It wasn't that we didn't care about social care or were interested, but also I think actually, you know, that, that some of that earlier work is quite important for the social care debate. Sure. So this report uh, is, is under the heading of an insight report and the previous version, uh, the, the most recent insight report we did before this one was called Our Aging Population, where we focused on uh, the kind of projected population aging, but what that meant for social care needs, uh, pulling together whatever data we could, and it's extremely limited is the answer, but survey data from the English Longitudinal Survey of Aging uh, on ADLs, so activities of daily living, how often people uh, are limited in their ability to perform daily tasks such as washing and feeding and, and dressing themselves. Um, and over time, what we're seeing in, uh, in, 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 it's highlighted in that work, and I'll, I'll put it in the chat, uh, is that the age at which people have those needs is actually getting later. So it's a different result to what we're seeing with the major illness and multiple mobility. So uh, the average number of kind of 70 year olds uh, with, living with a social care need is, is, is falling slightly, right? But those that, so, we did discuss social care a little bit in the implications of this report. Um, what's important to think about is that the, the medical needs, uh, the, the morbidity of patients that end up in social care is likely to be increased as well, which I think serves as, a, as an even stronger argument to be looking at uh, better integration between social care workforce and, and NHS workforce. I'll put that uh, link in the chat. So. Thank you, yes. Sarah, can I come to you first? Then, in Manchester, are there any other countries um, uh, that that you look to, or examples within countries? And there's a, one of the, the the points in the Q and A is is about you know just the extent to which the Wigan deal, if you like, and what's been going on there, provides a lot of the uh, model for what we need to be doing. So, so just picking up on the Wigan deal, obviously there are other kind of models in GM that that that, that are similar to that. But Hilary Cotton obviously did a lot of work in, with Wigan about about setting up the deal, and they're refreshing that at the moment. Um, that that deal the deal that they've got with the public about you know the responsibilities that the public have alongside um, uh, statutory services in order to um, 
uh, uh, make sure that they're doing the very best with the money that they've got, etc. And they have seen some real positives there. And that's a model, I think, that's helped sustain our thinking around uh, how we rolled out the ICB in, in Greater Manchester, seeing neighbourhood and place as key to foundation stones to things moving forward. So we've kept the 10 local authority areas as places in GM with teams that, that run at that level. Um, I think in terms of international examples, we're trying to um, think about things like the work in New Zealand, um, uh, uh, where, you know, looking at social value and how that's built into what we're doing, really focusing on um, uh, us as anchor institutions um, and, and making the very best of that. Um, and then um, even in Wales with the uh, future generations mm. uh, uh, approach and whether that's going to make a difference um, and allowing people to take that longer term view at the same time as having to deal with the here and now. And, and you know, those are examples where I think um, we, we I mean, the evidence is, is still to be collected, isn't it, on, on the longer term impact of those. But I think that's something that we would be looking to. And certainly going back to your earlier point about how do you ensure that, that there's a case for investment in prevention. Yeah. These are the examples that we're looking to to try to help to develop that as well as the evaluations that we're doing locally. Fantastic. Thank you. Camilla, at the RCGP, do you see other countries or models within uh, the, the, the UK and England that feel to you to be, you know, uh, directionally where we need to be heading? Uh, yes, um, I was going to mention New Zealand as well. Um, also, there are projects in Canada um, that are very um, holistic in terms of their approach to people's needs, um, not just concentrating on health, but also social social needs. Um, Fleetwood was the other place, if we're talking about the UK, uh, where there seems to be a lot of um, new stuff. And many people will have heard of the... Um, the, the services around Bromley by Bow in the east end of London, yeah. uh, which has been going for a couple of decades now. Um, what is sad about that is that it's not really replicated elsewhere. Um, it seems to be working really, really well with lots of services for community members and different portions of the community as well, um, concentrating on mental health as well as physical health, as well as social socialization and community cohesion. Um, but um, I, I, I don't see that many replications of it mm. um, because, mm. you know, if you've got a model there that works and is working well and people are proud of, which we are, then obviously the thing to do then is, you know, copy it. Yes, and, and, and that, that, that is one of our tensions, isn't it? And I, what, I'll ask you a little bit, is it, in that we have these pockets of amazing practice, of, of, of innovation, We'll have a national health service, um, and, uh, and 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 yet, and and we obviously it's really important to <clears throat> tailor to local circumstance. But our ability to learn from each other um, still feels quite and scale up those those, those, those models um, <laughs> within RCGP. Are there some things that? that you would like to see NHS England, central government do to help really get that, get, get, get that consistency across the country? <coughs> uh, I, I often feel that um, NHS England and government don't really understand what's going on in communities. Um, and they don't value some of the things that the public values. They don't value that very special relationship you have with your healthcare professional, uh, for example, um, you know, of course, I'm going to talk about the doctor patient relationship, but it's also the relationship with your district nurse, with your health visitor, etc. Um, and it, it, I, I think that our real problem is, is really workforce uh, yeah. and workload. Um, and, and, and until we can actually do something with that, it's going to be really difficult to make changes. But really, uh, bright spots like Bromley by Bow and what's happening in Fleetwood, um, you know, they, they really need to be picked up and, and run with and they need resource. It needs resource, which, of course, at the moment seems to be impossible. Although I suspect that if government really wanted to do it, they'd find the resource just as they did 
in COVID, just as they did with um, armaments for Ukraine, just as they did with these 36 new hospitals. If they want to do it, they can. Brilliant. Well, we are almost out of time. So, uh, sorry about that. Thank you for a brilliant discussion. Yeah. <clears throat> I encourage everybody to go and read Hillary Cotton to fire you uh, up for what, the, what can be done. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, 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 as Toby mentioned, this is the first in series of work um, in, in this area. Lots of the questions about inequalities. Uh, please uh, look out for our subsequent work before the end of the year on that. It just wants me to thank Toby, Sarah, Paul and Camilla for a great conversation and for all of you for joining and for everybody for some brilliant uh, points in the Q&A. Have a lovely day.